So good morning. Good morning. Lively, awake, ready to go. How uh, many of you were here yesterday? How many were not here yesterday? Sort of half and half. So I will um, try to combine a bit of what we covered yesterday and quite a lot of new stuff. And um, on this interesting topic of continuous innovation. And uh, let me begin by giving you my personal uh, background in this. I was working in the World Bank uh, for a number of decades, a um, big international organization. I was born in Sydney, Australia, actually, and uh, I joined the World Bank and climbed up the managerial ladder. And my uh, introduction to continuous innovation uh, came in February uh, 1996 when I was working in the World Bank and I was then the director of the Africa region. <coughs> wasn't going to solve our problem. We had to find a different role in life. So I had another idea. Why don't we share our knowledge? We had tremendous expertise on all sorts of different areas, but very difficult to get access to the World Bank's knowledge. And I said, why don't we reverse that? Why don't we make it very easy for anyone to find out what we know? And we could actually be a pretty interesting organization, even an exciting organization. Let's become a knowledge sharing organization. And the managers had a very clear answer for me. They said, Steve, this is the World Bank. We're a bank. We lend money. <laughs> Pay attention. This is what the World Bank does. And uh, so I was um, somewhat uh, put off by this, but I was believed in this idea. I thought it was a good idea. So I pressed ahead and I tried different ways to communicate it. I gave evidence. As you heard in some of the presentations, you, you develop evidence, and I had evidence. Nobody listened. I showed charts. Uh, nobody uh, paid any attention. Uh, in fact, nothing had any effect until I stumbled on the power of a story, which was somehow able to convey the idea of what I had in mind. And a very simple story. Uh, I'd be talking about the future of the World Bank and what's it going to be like. Well, I said it's going to be like today. Let me tell you about something that happened just a few months ago. In June 1995, this is still early 1996, in June 1995, a health worker in a little village in Zambia in Africa logged on to the website for the Center for Disease Control and got the answer to a question on how to treat malaria. And that was June 1995, not June 2018, it wasn't the capital. Zambia was a little village 600 kilometers away. And this is not a rich country. This is Zambia, one of the poorest countries in the world. But you know, the most important part of that picture for us in the World Bank, the World Bank is not in that picture. The World Bank does not have its knowledge organized to share with all the millions of people who make decisions about poverty. But just imagine if it was. Just imagine if we got organized. Think what an organization we could become. And yeah. It's sad to resonate first with staff, and then managers, and then senior managers. And then the president of the World Bank heard about it. He said, right, let's do it. He went to the annual meeting of the World Bank, uh, October 1, 1996, and announced to the finance ministers of the world, all their entourages, huge public occasion, we are going to do this. We are going to become the knowledge bank. We are going to share our knowledge with the world. And when the centurion guards surrounding the president heard this announcement, they were horrified because this was the worst case scenario. Uh, the man from Siberia uh, now was back and he had somehow managed to co-opt the president and a whole group of people in the organization to view this lunatic idea of becoming a knowledge sharing organization. So this wasn't the beginning. This wasn't the end of the war. This was just the beginning. This is when they started to use real bullets instead of rubber bullets because now there was a risk this damn thing might actually happen. And in fact, the next four years were a whole set of battles and struggles with the centurion guards as to whether we were going to implement what the president had already announced and if so, what it would look like. And I found that the only way I was able to win those battles was to tell stories about this idea and the impact it would have on our clients and potential clients and all the new people that it would bring into the services of the World Bank, not just the governments we were lending to, a whole array of new people who hadn't been able to get access to the World Bank. So it had a tremendous 
impact on the organization. And the World Bank in 2000 was named as one of the world's uh, most advanced knowledge sharing organizations. World Bank had never been <laughs> seen as the best in anything in management before. So it was a, a big breakthrough for the organization. But it was a story and the passion behind the story that enabled that to happen. And this is a big part of this um, thing in innovation is to, uh, it runs on passion. It runs on someone with an idea, someone with a crazy idea that is unstoppable. You can try to fire this person, you can try to stop them, you can tell them to go away. Uh, these people are unstoppable. That's the kind of people who lead this continuous innovation. And they're very annoying to the centurion guards in the organization because they cause trouble. They cause disruption. They cause, they, instead of the neat boxes that the centurion guards want to have in the organization, they are disturbing those neat boxes and doing things differently. So this is a little background of how I got into this whole subject. That was about knowledge sharing. Uh, we're talking in this conference about agile, but very similar changes in mindset is what is involved. And the big news that I mentioned yesterday, Agile is eating the world. <laughs> I might have read my Forbes article on this. And in fact, the largest firms in the world are no longer the big industrial giants. Uh, like the, they are the uh, agile firms, the digital agile firms, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft. These are the biggest firms on the planet. Um, I mean, five years ago, it was unthinkable that that would be the case, but now it is the case. Agile is a huge thing. And this current issue of Harvard Business Review has three leading articles on Agile, uh, another sign that Agile uh, is now part of the mainstream. And an interesting uh, finding in the article is that almost 80% of organizations want to be agile. 80% want to be agile. So this is uh, looking across the whole array of big organizations. They want to be agile. And we know how to, to be agile. I mean, you don't like my book. There are plenty of other books that tell you how to be agile. No lack of knowledge on how to be agile. Uh, the other interesting thing I mentioned is that uh, of all these organizations that want to be agile, only less than 20% are actually agile. So there's this big gap between the 80% who want to be agile and the less than 20% who are agile. So there's 60% in there of a massive, massive opportunity. So 80% want to be agile. Uh, we know how to be agile. The biggest firms are agile. And less than 20% are actually accomplishing this. And so those big five biggest firms who used to be worth, say, 300 $300 million are now worth $3 trillion, a tenfold uh, increase in value of those organizations. Uh, if you look at the, the gap between the 80% who want to be agile and the 20% are, they're worth about $20 trillion now. Imagine if there was a tenfold increase in value in those organizations if they became agile. That's like several hundred trillion dollars. So this is like a massive opportunity that's just in front of us, and the question is, who is going to take advantage of this opportunity? And I hope that it's going to be all the people in this room who are going to be part of this huge uh, revolution that's underway. And I suggested yesterday that uh, when I'm talking about Agile, I'm talking about what these three laws of Agile, not the 16 or the four values and 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto or the 40 different flavors of Agile that are floating around but three core principles. Uh, the law of the customer, that total focus of the organization on delivering value for the customer. Everyone in the organization has a clear line of sight to the customer. The work is done in small, self-organizing teams working in short cycles and getting feedback, right? feedback from customers at the end of cycles, descaling big problems into tiny pieces that small teams can handle them, not trying to scale up the organization, but actually trying to descale the problems that the organization is facing down into small issues, and not functioning as a hierarchy, top-down command and control, but a fluid network where information flows 
smoothly from across the organization, up the organization, down the organization. Uh, very different way of running an organization than a uh, top-down hierarchy. Those three principles are the three principles which have guided, to a large extent, those five biggest companies and the successful agile implementations in the world. And I drew a distinction yesterday between uh, operational agility and strategic agility. Operational agility, the sort of things that you'll hear in most of the workshops uh, today and was talked about in the previous session, uh, which is basically about making existing products better. They're better, faster, cheaper, more personalized, so that your existing customers are much happier and you have a better relationship for those customers. Uh, and I was talking about something else, though, strategic agility, which is bringing in new customers, people who are not currently customers, and making them customers. This is where the huge financial gains come from. This is why those five biggest firms have gone from nothing 20 years ago to $3 trillion today. They have been able to create new markets, uh, bringing in customers that simply weren't customers before. And I gave some examples of it, just to refresh your memory for those who are here yesterday, at um, some of the old examples. Uh, Edison didn't try to make a better candle. He created a, a different way of generating light, the light bulb, that strategic agility. Henry Ford didn't try to make a faster horse. He built a different way of getting around, a Model T car. The iPhone wasn't a better just a better phone. It was a multifunction device that did all sorts of other things. It was brought in a whole new group of customers. And uh, Amazon isn't simply making a better uh, retail. It's generating new businesses, which are bringing in new customers. It has Echo. It has web services. It has, this week, it's in thinking about getting into banking. It's already taking over groceries. It is a serial strategic innovator. Uh, and probably the best in the world right now. If you think about what's the company that is doing best in this strategic innovation, Amazon would uh, be at or near the top of that list. Or Netflix didn't stop with renting DVDs. It then moved on to streaming videos, and now it's uh, making, making movies, making series, uh, another serial innovator. And uh, what's happening in these cases is that you're not just looking at the existing customers, as we were hearing in the previous session, it's looking at the future potential customer, those who are not currently customers, uh, and finding ways to make them, turn them into customers. And why is this important? Well, the dark secret of the Agile movement is that simply making the existing products better for existing customers, that's a good thing, it's an essential thing, but it doesn't make an awful lot of money. And the assumption that it does is simply false. And the reasons for that, several, is first of all that um, there was greater competition than there was before. And so it's not only that you are agile, your competitors are already agile. And they are improving the product. And the customers now have much more power than they did in the past. The marketplace customers are now in charge of the marketplace. And so they are able to uh, insist that you get not just uh, the same product, uh, maybe even lower price. They will insist, we want a better product at a lower price, and if you don't deliver it, we will go for somewhere else. So here you are busy spending money improving the product, and the customer wants it at a lower price. How are you ever going to survive in that world? And it is a dilemma that has been described as operating in these bloody red oceans uh, where competitors are fighting each other for the limited amount of resources that are available from customers. Uh, that is a losing battle for most of the participants. And you need to move into these market-creating innovations if you want to make large financial returns. And that's what these big five have done. They are operating in what people have called blue oceans, where there is little or no competition, and you're able to establish a place in that market and then continuously improve so that other firms never catch up. So Google and, and Apple were able to do that, and 
other firms simply haven't been able to catch up with them. So in mobile phones, uh, 2007, um, there were a lot of firms that were making phones and a lot of firms were improving their phones, um, but none of them were making all that much money. Nokia was making more than the others, but none of them were making very much money. And Apple came along and said, let's think different. Uh, let's remove some of the features from the phone. The things that people love the most, the, I still meet people even today who are grieving over the loss of the BlackBerry keyboard. I mean, they took it away from me. They took away my, uh, you're removing the most valued function, <laughs> feature of the phone, um, taking that away, taking away the buttons, taking away the keyboard, and adding other things, adding a screen, adding the apps, adding um, a cool factor, design, cool design, and you have a, a product then that is irresistible. Everyone has to have it. It's, uh, uh, even I didn't have a mobile phone back in 2007. Now I had to have, I had to have my phone. And so Apple becomes uh, one of the richest firms in the whole wide world. More treasure than ever was imagined by anyone ever in the history of the world by creating strategic innovation. And why does strategic innovation need special attention? Well, there are these a number of reasons why that's the case. It is uh, the case that we heard in the previous session, and in fact, most of the sessions you'll hear in this conference are talking about making things better for existing customers. That's the nat natural thing, because you have the customers in front of you, they are complaining, you need to do this, you need to do that, and so it's natural to focus on that. <laughs> Strategic innovation, you have to set that aside and think there are things we could do differently that would transform the situation. And uh, teams and firms also hesitate to eliminate features. Eliminating the keyboard, uh, that is a hard decision. Uh, to say. And everyone in the organization will say, that's what people love about a Blackboard. You can't possibly take that away. That's what they love. And here you are taking away the thing they love. Um, and difficult decision. And it cannibalizes your existing products. So you take the iPhone, uh, it cannibalized the iPod. And it was a very tough decision on Apple to decide to put a music player that would basically destroy the iPod uh, in the marketplace in order to create this huge U market. And uh, Steve Jobs fought that decision for a long while, eventually was persuaded it had to be. And so uh, the iPhone became what it was. And these strategic investments may uh, involve large amounts of money. And the teams, team level or middle management level might not have the clout to be able to generate the investment <coughs> needed for these big innovations. So that's why you may need something more than uh, bread and butter agile to create these strategic innovations. It's not impossible. And here's one example where it was uh, created, was possible. Um, Discover Weekly and Spotify. Now I gather Spotify is not... Uh, operating here in India. Anyone use Spotify? No one. <laughs> Difficult to explain, but they are a stream music streaming service and my daughter was telling me about this amazing feature that they have that uh, it was somehow able to figure out what music you liked and every week they would give you 30 new songs and you found their your favorite songs. How did they find? How did they know that's what I wanted? How did and so I tried it out. Yeah, it was amazing. And uh, so I looked into it, and so there's a, it's now a big part of my book, uh, that this was actually the, the creation of a team of four people. And that what they were doing was trying to solve a problem that all of the music streaming companies had, Pandora, uh, Apple, Amazon, is that they have these vast array of songs. Uh, Spotify has 20 million songs. But how do you find in those 20 million songs the songs that you would really love. And so what they found is that users are spending most of their time searching for songs rather than actually listening to songs. So it was a big problem. And everyone knew it was a problem, but how to solve it? And the management at Spotify was trying to solve it by improving the search function. They had a 100 people working on trying to make the search function much better. And that was not making all that much progress. And meanwhile, they had a hackathon going. Spotify is a sort of agile organization. I had a hackathon 
and a couple of people said, let's, what if we did something different? What if we took the existing knowledge that we have about our 60 million users, uh, a lot of users, but they had been tracking what those music that those users had, and what if we compared that to the 20 million songs that we have in our look and our portfolio, and they had classified and categorized those 20 million songs, so they were able to match what users are currently doing with the 20 million songs that they had. What if we put those together, and without people having to ask for it, we simply inserted in their Spotify um, playlist a, a weekly playlist, and people would look in there without having to do anything. They would just open this playlist, and by magic, you would have 30 of their new favorite songs uh, all delivered. And the management said, well, that will never work. I mean, <laughs> 20 million songs, 160 million people, this is impossible. In fact, they had already done a lot of the background. They had investments in machine learning. They had investments in analyzing all those things. And so they did, um, the team uh, didn't get any encouragement from the management. But in this agile environment, they were able to make a test. And so what they did, they inserted this in the playlist of the employees of Spotify. They're all Spotify users. And they inserted this playlist and the users of um, on the employees and the employees um, started talking about where did this thing come from? There was no announcement. <laughs> they suddenly found there was this Discover Weekly and their playlist comes every week and these favorite songs were suddenly appearing. It was amazing. Uh, and so there was a whole lot of buzz within Spotify and that then enabled them to get approval to test it out on 1% of the Spotify users, 600,000 people. And it was the same reaction. This is amazing. And so they then rolled it out with uh, 21 countries and 15 different time zones all around the world. And it was a huge, huge success. People like my daughter were wandering around saying, you've got to have this. You have to have this thing. And I tried it out. And yes, I had to have it. And so that's why they went from uh, 60 million to 150 million and users and why they're having a, a um, a big uh, offering on the stock market um, later this month. A huge element how strategic innovation created this possibility of what Spotify might become. A couple of other examples of what this looks like. Uh, Cirque du Soleil. Anyone know what Cirque du Soleil is? No? <laughs> One. Uh, this is... Um, uh, it does come to India, right? I'm looking on the web. But um, it, it, circuses are typically full of clowns and animals, and they appeal to children. And it is a dying uh, uh, business in the United States. Um, and what Cirque du Soleil did was say, let's reinvent the whole idea of a circus. Let's get rid of the things that people value the most. Let's get rid of the animals. It's a big problem. Everyone loves them, but that's a big problem. Let's get rid of the clowns. They're kind of clunky. Let's upscale this whole thing so that we have acrobats. We certainly, we have cool music, and we create a, a, something that is appealing not only to kids, but to whole families. The adults uh, might like it too. And yes, it became a huge success. And all around the world, Cirque du Soleil is now uh, really replaced circuses by taking away the things that people love and adding some other things that they loved even more and creating a vast new market for circuses. Or uh, another example is this um, it's American uh, firm of gyms, fitness centers uh, for women. Uh, and what they did was, they, again, they what they found was that women didn't have time to go to a, a real gym. And in fact, they didn't want all of the equipment in an elaborate gym. All they, and they didn't like having men around looking at them. <laughs> they wanted to have something that was focused on women and was very simple and was uh, very friendly, user-friendly, women-friendly. And again, they took away the things that people valued in gyms, took away the equipment, took away the trainers. 
They took away the things that were central and they created a vast new market for people who hadn't been customers of GEMS. Another example of a, this kind of innovation is often taking away the very thing that people value highly and finding that if you do that, you may be able to create a vast new market for what you were doing. And uh, to enable this to happen, they say you need to go beyond bread and butter agile. You need an innovation playbook. And the four main elements of this, it comes from Kurt Carlson, uh, the um, former CEO of the uh, SRI International, Silicon Valley Group. And it has these four elements, a need, an approach, benefits, and the competition. And these are the elements of a value proposition which will enable you to find things like Discover Weekly or like Curves or like the SIP, the Soleil. And you start out by thinking, what is the unmet need and how large is it? What is some need that is not currently being met by what we or others are doing and how large is it? Is it a something that are only a few people or is it something that is vast? And when it was, say, like the Spotify thing, all of the 60 million users had this problem, how to find the music they would love. And so it was a very large need. And so, yes, it was a need. And the approach, how do you uh, find something that is unique to your particular company that they could uh, meet the need in a way that would be difficult for others to copy? So in Spotify, for instance, they had already made this investment in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and classifying the existing tastes of the users and classifying their music. So they had done all of the background work and it was quite quick to be able to implement it and very difficult for these other big companies, even Amazon and Apple, capable as they are to catch up because they didn't have that work in place. So Spotify has established uh, a beachhead, if you like, in this blue ocean. Uh, they're facing these monst big monsters, Apple and Amazon, so no one knows the outcome of this uh, eventual war, but at least at this point, Spotify looks well positioned because they had met a need, they had an approach, and the benefits were huge, uh, both for the, ben the customers. They could suddenly get the um, uh, music they they love without doing anything. They didn't. It was frictionless. It was intimate. It was um, it cost nothing, and for Spotify, it was created this huge energy and excitement with word of mouth, like my daughter wandering around telling people, you've got to have this. And so it went, led to this huge benefit for Spotify. And the competition, often the biggest competition, is the user doing nothing. They just put up with the way things are. So, okay, search, searching for music is a pain, and I'm just not going to do it. That's the, that's the real competition. So it it had to be something that was so easy, so frictionless, that people would would just happen anyway. And so they overcame the competition, which is basically doing nothing. And uh, so that's the, the basic idea of strategic innovation. And uh, let me just pause here and uh, largely a recap of yesterday with a few new elements. But uh, let me pause and see anyone have any questions about what we've covered so far. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, could you? I didn't hear the first part of your. Uh, you described about this NABC framework. But like when Spotify came up with this idea of you know uh, curated list so to, so to say or like uh, mm -hmm. looking at customers uh, you know actual preferences and creating a playlist for them, mm -hmm. they didn't have this framework in place at that time, right? It, it was an afterthought that somebody looked at their process and saw okay it kind of fits this framework. Right? Is that mm -hmm. how it went about? Or? Yeah, I mean I'm I'm splicing together two parts of this equation. Uh, the the team in Spotify didn't use this explicit framework. Um, this framework was developed quite separately by 
Kurt Carlson, the head of, um, of um, SRA International from 1998 to 2014. He's written a book about it, and there's a big section in my book, Age of Agile, about this framework. But this wasn't the framework that that team used. This was just a couple of guys. Uh, we have a better idea, We're trying to make it better. Um, we think it will work. We try it out, and boom, it, it takes off. They didn't use the framework. Well, what they were trying to do is, how could you replicate that? What were the intellectual steps that they were taking, um, which would enable you to find sol similar solutions in other cases? So you, you could suppose, you know, for instance, you have an app to help people find restaurants. Um, you could go on making that app um, better and better for your existing customers, but you could also be thinking, how could I make a big leap? How could I develop a restaurant app that would transform the market, that would be so different, that would create a whole lot of people who don't use restaurant apps, would create people like my daughter, would say, Steve, you've got to have it. You're going to Bangalore. You actually absolutely have to have this app because if, without that, you're going to die. And, and, <laughs> and it's creating that passion uh, in the user. Um, and in order to create that passion, you has, have to have that passion and dream what this dream could be and to realize the dream, you have to have passion driving it. So but thanks. That's a great question. So I will, it's quick comment you you did mention uh, you did mention about the uh, right understanding the difference between the 80% who say they want to be agile and the less than 20% who are agile I agree that there's a whole lot of uh, noise going on. They may not understand what is agile. They may find once they get into it that it challenges some of their basic beliefs. Uh, it may challenge some of their executive compensation. It may challenge all sorts of things. Um, and they may eventually decide, well, we don't want to do it. Um, and those companies probably not going to be around uh, for all that much longer uh, because we are, I think, in the age of agile. And unless you are moving in this direction, um, you are going to find it very difficult to even maintain your existing position and even more difficult to create even greater value. So that's what, a... What Spotify? Is the Spotify is not really a case of strategic agility, correct? The, the, example, you the gave. example I gave yeah. is an example yeah, of strategic okay. agility. Yeah. They are also very actively improving their existing product, all sorts of little innovations. But let me move on with a few more, uh, more slides, and, and, and we can then come back and answer more questions. And if we don't have time to answer them, I'll be around for the next day or so, and you can follow up there. And uh, so this is kind of inverting the, the normal statement that customers are number one. No. Uh, Non-customers are number one. Your main focus should be on non-customers uh, if you're interested in strategic innovation. It's not that you set aside operational innovation. You keep going with that. But if you want to get into the strategic innovation where the big gains, you need to be thinking about people who are not your current customers. And uh, you're adding this, uh, them together with the customers in this equation on the bottom. It's the customers and the non-customers over the cost that determines whether you're actually generating value for the organization. And there are several different types of um, innovation um, promoted by different writers. There's the Blue Ocean Strategy people who are very much interested in cases like the Cirque du Soleil and the curves where you eliminate some key features and so bring in a whole lot of 
people who are not currently customers. Uh, disruptive innovation is talked a lot by uh, about by uh, Clayton Christensen and talks about cases where somebody comes up with a a low cost version of something, with it, uh, like Ryanair or these cheap airlines, which eliminate some of the key features of existing airlines, and so bring in a whole lot of users who weren't currently users of airlines, or changing the nature of the actual experience. A Spotify example, uh, Discover Weekly would be an example that of making uh, using Spotify just a much more friendly and exciting experience than it was before. And so it transformed the relationship to Spotify. Those are different uh, variants, different flavors of, of strategic innovation. And as I say, this thing runs on passion. <laughs> this is about someone who believes who thinks that this has to happen. And unless it happens, I'm going to go to somewhere where I'll make it happen. I am going to make this happen. It's those kinds of people <laughs> who are very annoying in an organization <laughs> um, who are going to be leading this kind of innovation. Unless you have that kind of passion, it's not going to work. Because you have in these big organizations a whole lot of centurion guards and systems and processes uh, aimed at preventing you from doing this. And so it's only if you have that kind of passion you're going to be able to uh, make it work. And so here are six steps uh, to do this on a systematic basis, not the way uh, Discover Weekly was done, which was just kind of stumbling on it, or what happened in the World Bank. Um, it um, we were not done by any systematic process, but just but this is about the kinds of things that you would need to do if you wanted to do this over and over again. And uh, this is um, what Kurt Carlson did at SRA International. They talk about like, quite a lot in the book is that he did this over and over again, not just once uh, or twice like Apple or Spotify, but again and again and again. And one of his has the best known example is Siri, um, the gadget for the which was bought by Apple and became a big part of the iPhone, where you give voice instructions and yeah, the, the phone does what you tell it to do. Um, that was something that was developed using this kind of specific methodology. He, when he arrived at SRA International, uh, they were practically bankrupt. They had very smart people, uh, but they had a lot of inventions, but they had never been able to monetize the inventions. They would uh, launch them quickly and they would just fade away, even though they were brilliant inventions and then Often they were picked up by some other firm, and the other firm made a lot of money out of them. Um, and so he set out to make a whole series of multi-million dollar strategic innovations and proved it. Uh, over the next 16 years, he showed how to do it. So this is a set of conceptual steps uh, to make this happen. But it, as I say, <laughs> keep in mind always that it runs on having a champion with passion that is driving this process along. And the first step is getting started about, and you think uh, we need both regular agile operational innovation and strategic innovation. And you might <coughs> have different degrees of uh, priority uh, depending on your situation. SRI International um, back in, um, in 1998, uh, it needed massive strategic innovation. It needed big, big, big um, value-creating <coughs> innovation. So it put a lot of emphasis on strategic innovation. Fun firms that are doing very well uh, might be able to put uh, simply coast along <coughs> with operational innovation and be thinking uh, with less urgency about uh, creating new businesses. <coughs> so it very much depends on your current um, situation. Uh, and the key is to have a, a balanced portfolio given where your firm is in the overall uh, ecology of the, of the sector. And firms basically need both. Uh, the second step is you develop this innovation playbook that I talked about, the need, the approach, the benefits, and the competition uh, with your idea and systematically develop value propositions. And with uh, SRI, um, on, with Siri, they actually spent 
three years discussing the value proposition before they spent any money. Uh, three years, just over and over again, trying to figure out how this is going to work and what is the need for it and who is going to pay for it and how, uh, at the time, they couldn't figure out uh, how the whole picture was going to fit together. In retrospect, it's obvious, but it, when they were trying to work it out, they, they couldn't see it. You could see that voice was able to activate uh, the, the, uh, an iPhone. Um, they could see that you had all this data. Um, you could see there are all the things you could possibly do with it. Um, how would it actually work? And their initial hypothesis that they actually went to market with was that they would focus on things like restaurants and pharmacies and uh, and simply be a guide to where people could find those things. And their hypothesis was that the the pharmacies and the and the restaurants would pay a commission to be part of of the scheme. That was their idea. But it turned out that Apple wanted it for their um, the iPhone to make it a feature of the iPhone, so they bought the whole thing, and they didn't have to worry about the commission. So they, the value proposition changed. But the key thing was that they, they spent three years discussing, trying to figure out exactly what it would be before they spent any money. And that's a key part of this is to get clear on the value proposition long before you actually spend money on the thing. And uh, uh, third step is you do look at the existing pain points of the uh, of the current customers, um, the but you also look at this the non customers. The non customers are number one, and you think about well, there are several categories that those that are thinking about becoming customers but just haven't got around to doing it. They are kind of the easy, low hanging fruit, and then there are customers who've who've looked at what you're offering. And it said, no way, no way am I going to buy your product, buy your service. And then there are people who just haven't given it any thought. They're just living in a different world. Um, those are potentially the most difficult to uh, bring in, but they are a, typically a huge, huge uh, group of people. And if you can bring them in, that is what transforms the organization. And then step four, um, reimagine the market boundaries. Reimagine uh, what the market would like. That is, in the iPhone, it's not just a phone, but it's a gadget that will do all these other things. And so, Apple wasn't a competitor of Nokia and and BlackBerry and Motorola. It came from nowhere and suddenly wiped out those organizations in the phone market because they had a different. It changed the boundaries of what that sector would look like. So you don't these days have what you had in the 20th century was things, firms were in industries. So in your industries, you had Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, and that was the world. Uh, you didn't have people zooming in from outside and wiping out the whole uh, business. So these days, you need to be thinking way beyond your existing boundaries of your industry and uh, look beyond that. And then figure out how to get there. Um, which factors uh, are the things which are taken for granted and that can be eliminated or reduced? I mean, eliminate the BlackBerry keyboard. Oh, can't do it. Eliminate the um, uh, the machines in a gym. <laughs> what a dumb idea. Uh, these are things where you're reimagining what uh, the sector would, and they're going to look like really bizarre ideas. And you'll find the centurion guards in the organization will be saying, don't do it. Don't touch that. That is sacred. That is that is our heritage. That is everything we stand for. And here you are putting all of that in question. So uh, this, this probably has to be something done by a separate group, not by people who are run by the centurion guards, but a group that is dedicated to creating these different ways of doing things. So, you might take things away, but you add other features. Let's add to the iPhone a big screen, not a minuscule screen you can hardly read, but a big, nice screen where you can see it in color. Or let's add apps where it can do all sorts of things, not just the phone. You add things as well as subtracting things, and things that may never have been offered before. And then finally put it all together into a portfolio, which is driven by champions. You have to have a champion 
for each idea. If you don't have a champion who has passion, <laughs> then you shouldn't be even pursuing that idea. It's only going to happen if you have someone who's willing to take on the centurion guards and drive this through all the opposition that a big organization will undertake. Prioritize though those possibilities and have more than one uh, possibility because it is likely that uh, some ideas are not going to work out. So if you only have one idea, um, then you have a lot of risk. So you should be looking at this as a set of options. Now, often what happens in a big organization, you have a huge fight at the top of the organization about which option to pursue. And one faction likes this thing and another faction likes that thing and they have a huge battle and one side wins. So, okay, that is the option. And then the organization gets locked into that. That was the winning and even though, as they test it out, it turns out that it's not such a great idea and isn't bringing in new customers because that battle was so bloody and so difficult and, and the organization is committed to this losing idea, uh, they don't see other options which lost that original battle. So you have to have this view of looking at the portfolio as a set of options, which you haven't made final decisions you haven't made commitments, you are simply pursuing an option and testing whether it's going to succeed. And only when you've actually carried out all the tests and you know it's going to succeed, uh, you can try it out. And this is not about failing fast. There's a whole uh, lot of um, talk in the lean startup world about failing fast. This is not about failing fast. This is about always succeeding. By the time you launch this thing, you know you know it's going to succeed because you've done, uh, you're clear on the need, you understand the benefits, you understand the competition, you've tested it out as in Spotify, you've tried it out on the staff of Spotify, you've tried it out on 1% of the users, everyone loves it, this is a winner. It was, it was not a risky uh, decision to roll that out across the, all the 60 million users because you knew it was going to be a success. So it's not about failing fast, it's about learning fast and then guaranteeing success. And uh, again, what is driving this is passion. Passion! You must believe that this is going to transform the world. It's those kinds of people uh, you need to be put in charge of, of these things and drive them to success in the organization. So that's the methodology. But it's, as I say, it's very much a people thing. It's very much uh, a passion thing. And uh, But you do need to be smart in driving the passion. I talk about it a lot in the book. I have a couple of chapters on how to make this work in an organization. And uh, I have copies of the book here, shameless plug. I'll be happy to sign them uh, for you. But uh, we have time, I hope, for uh, maybe not a question. It's 10.15. Uh, I'll be around. And um, if you uh, want to be, ask me some questions, I'll be happy to um, to, to explore that. But I, I think we're fully up. Done 15. Time is up. Any time? Uh, no, I don't. No time. Five minutes for questions. Five minutes. Okay, we have five minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. well, the, I think that the question is how do we get out of this uh, dogma about failing fast? And the answer is I think we need to recognize that the the whole sort of rationale of a lean startup was was good if you're a couple of guys in a garage and trying to figure out something that might make a few dollars. Um, actually testing this out with a website that doesn't have a product might be uh, one thing you could do to figure out whether there's a market for your crazy idea. 
but if you're in a, a significant organization um, and you're talking about uh, you, you want innovations that are going to make a significant amount of money, that is not a good way to go. To build a website that doesn't have a product, find out no one likes it, fail fast, and then pivot. Um, that will simply discredit your idea within the organization and you'll never be able to uh, pursue it ever again. Uh, so you want to avoid that by pursuing this methodology, um, need, approach, benefits, competition. Go through those steps and uh, discuss it over and over and over again until you know that this is an idea that makes sense, that there is a large need and that we have been able to quantify the need, and we know what the benefits for the people who would use it would be, and we know what the benefits for us as an organization, and we know uh, what the competition, uh, particularly the competitive people not doing anything, not using it at all. We've thought through all of that, and after you've thought through that, over one, two, three years, or however many years it takes, then you, then you start trying it out. Uh, in practice, but uh, this is not about failing fast. It's about learning fast and learning intelligently and thinking through uh, what we're going to do. I think we lost the audience. Uh, we'll have to make way for the next session, but thanks very much. I'll be around and got any more questions, be happy to answer them. Thanks very much.